What's up, everybody? Are you here to hear, here to hear, so to hear is spelled differently, to listen about how you can develop lagging body parts? That's what this episode's all about. And to celebrate, we're doing a giveaway. So here's the giveaway. We have what are called MAPS mods. These are MAPS workout programs for specific body parts, programmed for lagging body parts. In other words, you want to bring up your chest, we have a MAPS chest mod. You want to bring up a biceps, we have a biceps mod. We have one for every single major muscle group, and we're going to give one away for free right now to one of you viewers. Here's how you can enter to win. Leave a comment the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. If we pick your comment, we'll notify you, and then you can take and pick the mod of your choice. Follow it. Bring up those lagging body parts. Also, because this episode surrounds that, it's all about lagging body parts, we have the MAPS mods on all the body parts, 50% off right now just for this episode. So if you have a lagging body part, you want to follow routine specifically for that body part and just plug it into your normal routine, these mods are very effective. You can check them out at mapsmods.com. That's M-A-P-S-M-O-D-S.com. And then the code for 50% off any of them or all of them is MODS50 off. So MODS50 off will give you half off any of those mods or all of those mods. All right, here comes the show. We got to talk about a topic that keeps coming up. So it's like one of the most annoying things for people, lagging weak body parts. Body parts that don't develop yeah. like the rest. Like respond already. Of the, bo of the body. Are we going to define that as uh, like from an aesthetic perspective? Is that where we're, where we're going with this? Is that more for somebody who's like, hey, my shoulders are underdeveloped in comparison to my chest? Or Boy, my that's a great, that's a great point you're making there. I, yes, for the, for the, you know, for this episode, but um, I think this is true for movement as well. And it's typically Definitely. like lagging movement patterns or muscles that maybe not doing what they're supposed to. But yeah, for the sake of this particular episode, really it's more from an aesthetic standpoint. Body parts that don't seem to develop like the rest of the body, which most people have this, right? Most people, if you talk to them who've, who've been working out for a long time, you can ask them which body part do you have that is the most stubborn? Like which one do you have that doesn't seem to respond like the rest? And a lot of times uh, clients that'll come in with that uh, we'll, we'll think immediately it was a genetic, uh, you know, gift that was passed on. Like, this is something that they can't really do anything about. This is just how it's always been. It's how I grew up. Like, you know, my muscles just don't really uh, respond the way they should because of uh, how I was born. Yeah. What do you guys, do you guys have body parts? What are your bit lagging body parts that you guys have found? Oh, my calves, dude. Yeah. We've been talking yeah. about that for seven years now. Yeah, I know. I, yeah, yeah. 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 I, think, I feel I like, at, I feel I like you like knew that answer. answer. Yeah. All right. It's just like, you know, it's like Besides, me asking you about your chest right now. Oh, come on. <laughs> like, like, come on, Jeff. Like, you, come on, Adam. We're going to throw shots over the no, battle right no, now. No, Let's no. go, dude. I was going to say that. <laughs> no, but I mean, do you have- I'm Like my biceps, maybe? I don't well, know, dude. You know what, though? My, um, I mean, calves have always been something, but it's- uh, it, it wasn't something that I, when I first started to kind of piece this together and where this episode is going, my shoulders were the first thing that, and I, I've shared this story on the podcast before. I was 21 years old, managing my first gym. You got shoulder implants. I had, yeah, I got shoulder <laughs> implants. I had a, a, a female trainer. Uh, she was like in her 40s at that time, and she was a female competitor. Mm. Great physique, uh, been in the industry for quite some time already. And because she was in bodybuilding, I, th I wanted her assessment, her honest assessment of my physique. And I was like, you know, I want you to be brutally honest. Tell me the areas that if you were coaching me where you work on. And she says, Adam, you have weak shoulders. Was, was, like, she, was she yeah, Russian? Yeah, was she? yeah, she was. <laughs> she, and she told me I had weak they shoulders. Weak. <laughs> you know, you didn't have to be that brutal. Like well, that. It, what really actually got to me was that, like, I guess I never thought I really did. But then she, like, broke it down. She says, you know, you you really don't have much rear delt development. Um, mm. You know, you've got kind of like these sloping, I mean, she just continued to go on and like fucking broke my heart, right? <laughs> I was like, okay, that's enough. I get the point where we're going from. But it was great because it, then, it, then it sent me down this path of like really programming around, okay, well, how do I address this? Yeah. And that was kind of what, I mean, what has led us today to building programs like Maps Aesthetic, the ability for me to be able to shape and sculpt my body to get on stage. Like mm -hmm. that began then. That's up, up until that point, I'm, I'm not thinking that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, that sent me on that path. And I would actually say now, I would say my shoulders are one of my stronger points. Maybe not my best, but it's one of my stronger attributes as far as my, at least that's what the judges would give me as my feedback when I'd get on stage. And so 
it's pretty cool to know that you know you could have a you know a genetically lagging body part or a lagging body part based off of maybe your poor connection there or all the other reasons that we'll address but it doesn't mean you got to be stuck with it forever and it doesn't mean that you can't change that yeah it's i so i had uh i had no shoulders at all and so same thing for me now shoulders now are one of my stronger body parts chest that's always a struggle for me legs I had my knees were bigger than my quads. <laughs> I literally had skinny legs like to the point where, caps. yeah, I was like just this knees, and then they they responded very well through the type of training I did. And today it's still chest and you know calves still, and you know lagging doesn't necessarily mean not developed either. I think sometimes uh, what lagging means for some people is it just doesn't it's not symmetrical or balanced with the rest of the body, right? Because right. in in you put someone's body part that they feel like it's lagging on someone else and it seems to match. So it's really but just not necessarily responding as well uh, as the rest of the body. And I know, Justin, you don't have any, right? Everything's perfect. I mean, I, I do. It's just, uh, it, it changes all the time because yeah. I'm just constantly looking at it from a movement, like what I'm weak in and what I haven't like yeah. addressed. And so it inevitably, like it could be my back, you know, it could be my biceps. Like some of my arms aren't really defined. I'd like mm -hmm. them. It just kind of like moves around. Yeah. So, you know, here's some of the main reasons. And I think, you know, it'll be important that we get into strategies to improve lagging body parts but the the number one reason why people have lagging body parts and i hate to say this because a lot of people listening will be like that's not true but if you're honest with yourself i think you'll see some truth here is that they just don't put as much focus on that body part like they do other body parts so you'll hear like for me one of the reasons why my calves lag for so long is i just early days i never trained them so the first 10 years of my workout career, my calves were kind of an afterthought, right? It's not a beach muscle. Mm -hmm. So now I have 10 years of everything else being developed and that not being necessarily trained. And you see that with a lot of people. They'll say, oh, this is a weaker body part. And you say, well, what have you done for it? Are you consistent with it like other areas? And oftentimes that's not the case. There are some genetic issues, right? There's uh, your, your insertion and origin. So longer muscle bellies, that's the actual meat of the muscle makes a muscle easier to develop than a shorter muscle belly. Um, muscle fiber density. This not just, be not just easier, too. It'll look different. Yeah. That's you what know, I mean. I, yeah. I mean, I would explain this to somebody, too, that would it was really common, um, you know, like, was it was like 15 years ago or so. Like, when, when was J-Lo blowing up, right? When J-Lo first started to blow up, like, I Dude, literally... old, bro. Won, more than 15 like years 90s? ago. 90s? Yeah, know, I mean, 15, 20 years ago, right? Yeah. Somewhere around there. But it was like literally... Every other female client that came to to work with me at that time would be like, "Can I build a J Lo butt?" Like that was the that was like a super common question yeah. that I was asked, and I was always having to explain that, you know, yes, we can develop your glutes absolutely to to be bigger than they are currently right now, but also keep in mind half of what kind of gives the the illusion or the look of of someone's butt or any muscle to your point is the origin and insertion. If somebody has a very short origin insertion they're gonna get kind of this bubbly yeah. look if you have somebody that has a very long origin and insertion they're gonna have this kind of flatter kind of natural look to that so mm -hmm. even when it grows it's not gonna have this yeah, like short little butt. bubble look it's gonna get you know bigger but it's yeah. not gonna look yeah. exactly the same yeah you know it's funny with other body parts it's the opposite like you want long long you know insertions with biceps or calves but maybe you not know, necessarily. I the think butt. that's one of the most noticeable ones is is biceps and calves because that's you go if somebody flexes right and you'll see like a little ball yeah. on top versus like you know one that's a little bit more uh, you know all the way down to to the elbow. Yep, and then there's also like you know muscle fiber types. Uh, certain muscle fibers build more than other muscle fiber types, and genetics will play a role. Now it's argued that your muscle fiber type, I guess, ratio is consistent throughout the whole body. But there's some theories that say that might not be the case through the whole body. And in some cases, you may have more endurance muscle fiber types in some muscle groups versus others, which makes them harder um, to develop. And then one of the main reasons is a, and I, 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 you know, I'm using this word or this phrase loosely. carefully, loosely, <laughs> which is lack of connection. Now, I know lack of connection literally means you can't connect to the muscle at all. It's dead. I don't mean that. What I mean is, when you're doing an exercise or a lift, especially a compound exercise, there's lots of movements, excuse me, lots of muscles involved in a particular movement. Mm -hmm. And that means that they can perform the lift with different ratios of tension your, and strength. Your prime so, movers and your secondary cast. Totally. So you do a bench press. I'm going to make up some numbers, but let's say you do a bench press and 60% of the load is carried by the pecs 
and 20% by the triceps and 20% uh, by the shoulders. So there, there's your, your ratio. Well, what if for you, because of the way you do the lift and the way you learned it and just the way that you practiced it, it's more like 40% goes to the pecs and 30% goes to the chest and triceps, right? So now when you work out, you get different development than someone who has different, maybe, you know, again, loosely muscle recruitment patterns. This is a big issue, I think, because like a barbell squat can be very glute focused, but it can also be very quad focused. A row can be very bicep focused or very back focused. A pull up can be lat or bicep, right? Shoulder press, we could do that more tricep and we could do it more shoulder. And you can go on and on with compound lifts. And this this issue right here, I think, is is especially with the consistent people who work out consistently and constantly work on their lagging body parts. This tends to be a big issue. I remember uh, when I f first figured this out, I, I had a guy hire me, and uh, he actually was in incredible shape, and he had an incredibly strong bench, but he was hiring me to help him develop his chest. It was mm. a, a lagging body party, so I just haven't been able to figure it out, and he would tell me, I bench all the time, I got this, and he had the most massive-looking triceps yeah. that mm. I'd ever seen, and it just, it, and at first, it didn't make sense to me. I'm like, this is this is when I, I figured it out, but when, at first glance, I was like, this guy's benching this much weight, and he does chest all the time. Like, it doesn't make sense until I saw him perform the movement, and you could see, you could see the way he benched. You could see the tricep was carrying yeah. way more. So to your point about it being 20%, there's an example of, and again, I'm going to use hypothetical numbers, right? He was probably using 40% of his chest and then he was using more like you know 35 or 40 percent of his triceps and then the other bit of his shoulders like you know and that's a perfect example of somebody who can still have can mm -hmm. be very strong in a lift still consistently lifted all the time but then the muscle not develop like you would think it would develop from that and we see that a lot in muscles like that from things like benching you also see that a lot um, with probably squatting, right? Oh, yeah. A lot of people know that squatting uh, <clears throat> glutes are supposed to develop with squats, but how many clients have you guys trained where you know they say they squat three times a week and they have a flat Quads butt and it's all quads? You know? Yeah, yep, yep, no, no. So this takes us to the first point, the first thing you should focus on with a lagging body part, which is the mind to muscle connection. Can you actually focus on and feel the target muscle with the exercises? and make that target muscle, your lagging body part, do most of the work. Mm. Now, there's some important things to note with this, which is you're probably going to lift significantly less weight when you do it this way. If you're used to squatting and you know you squat, let's say, 200 pounds, and you don't know why your butt's not developing, and it's all your quads, and you go to change the connection to your glutes, change your form and technique, and feel it more in your glutes, you're not going to use 200 pounds. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to back way down to 100 pounds because you're essentially, what you're doing is you're learning a brand new movement. Same thing you talked about bench press, right? If it's like a shoulder and tricep exercise for someone, they're typically more tucked in and tight with their bench, and that's giving mm -hmm. them the big numbers. Well, you're going to have to put your ego aside, flare your elbows out a little bit, focus on what the pecs are doing, and lift a lot less weight to get that mind-to-muscle connection. So that's really an important key of this particular Yeah, you really have to set pack. yourself up <clears throat> posturally and, and get aligned perfectly so that way, too, you can actually perform the correct function of where it's supposed to really activate and, and recruit uh, that specific muscle so you can really try to hone in and isolate. And so it's a little bit different than priming too that we're talking about mind-muscle connection because I'm trying actually to get that squeeze and really intrinsically squeeze hard. So the harder I can, I can squeeze and connect and get tension out of my muscles, the more likely I'm going to be able to start, you know, training it to recruit uh, at a higher volume. Well, this is another great example of where there's tremendous value around isometrics. Hundred percent. We we talk. I think we did an episode recently, right, where we got into like a lot of the benefits from isometrics. Here's an incredible one. If you have somebody who has a really hard time connecting to a a muscle they're trying to develop because it's a lagging body yeah, part, squeeze the shit out of it in isometrics. Yes, first. yeah. And and so what that looks like for me as a trainer who's helping somebody do that, like for example, the guy that I was helping back then. It's taking them in a movement and having them hold in a in a isometric contracted position and getting them to think like when you're when I got them holding down at the ninety degree at the very bottom right or then I got them holding at the very top is using a light enough weight 
that I can have him pause yeah. in those positions and then teaching him. And I'm over there as a trainer, like connect, connect, right. squeeze, you know, and try and intensify right here and getting mm -hmm. them to do that instead of just going through the motion of getting the weight up and seeing how much more weight they can lift. Hey, let's reduce the weight significantly and let's do a, a real good squeeze at the bottom and the top of the rep so you can really work on that connection. Yeah, you know what helped me a lot with this uh, was when I first became certified as a trainer and I learned uh, muscle action. Once I started to learn what the action of a muscle, and you don't need to get all crazy with this. You don't need to go learn tons yeah. of you know physiology and anatomy. Just angles and leverage. Right? Yeah, you just start to just figure out what the muscles do in your lifts. Okay, so I'll give you an example. Okay, so if I'm doing a, a chin up, right? So so supinated grip. That's palms back, chin up. My biceps are doing this, right? My biceps are are flexing my elbow. So the the chin up aspect where I'm doing the chin up, the part that my bicep's doing is this part. The part that my lats are doing is it's pulling my elbow down. So this is lat, this is bicep. So if I want to make it more bicep focused when I do my chin up, you think I'm about focusing the on the curl. If I want to focus more and make it more lat focused, I'm focusing on the elbows pulling down, right? If we're doing a bench press, for example, the if I want it more pec focused, my elbows are going to come out a little bit more because mm -hmm. the pec brings the, uh, the upper arm, right, the humerus, across the body. This is what the pectoralis does. What does a tricep do? It extends the elbow. So I can focus on what the muscle action is, right? When you do a squat, for example, what does a glute do? The glute is taking your leg and kicking it back. The quad is extending the knee. So now knowing that, if I want to make it quad focused and I do my squat, I'm focusing on the knee extension part. If I want to make it more glute focused, I'm focusing more on the hip extension part. And this takes practice. This is this is a, the part of mu mind-muscle connection that takes practice. Mm -hmm. But if you think about the muscle action while you're doing the lift and you know, okay, this is what that muscle is doing. Let me focus on that part of this particular exercise while you're doing it. You'll slowly start to feel more of a connection. Well, I used to coach, I used to say to this to my clients, that all we'd be standing in the gym and I'd be showing them all these exercises and they'd be, oh, I'm so confused by all this stuff. I said, listen, all this stuff, okay, all these weights and dumbbells and all it is is flexion of the muscles with some sort of resistance, yeah. whether that be a band, a machine, a dumbbell. So actually my goal as your trainer is to first get you to know how to flex all these muscles mm -hmm. really good. And now using some sort of resistance, some feedback, it's easier to teach somebody sometimes. But the goal really is that can I get you to learn how to flex Every on on command, can I tell you like, flex me your lats? You know, right. flex me flex me your shoulder, flex me your bicep. And then there's easy ones, right? Everybody knows how to flex their bicep, but you should be able to get to it, and that should be a good goal. Like, can I get to a place where I can think about a muscle and I know how to flex it? And that, to your point, is like understanding the action, the movement mm -hmm. that it does helps you get there, so you can figure that out. And that's really when we're in the gym, we're practicing at flexing that muscle really well. If you know how to do that, you can then get in any machine or any exercise and perform it if you know the desired outcome is to flex a certain muscle and you already know how to intrinsically do that without any sort of weights, you just apply that to that machine. 100%. And this is why some exercises fit into different categories, like like parallel bar dips. Oh, it's a chest exercise. No, it's not. It's a tricep exercise. Actually, it's both, or mm -hmm. it could be more of one right. or more you of the other. Emphasize one or the other. Yes. And the key is this. Uh, when you're doing mind and muscle connection, especially for lagging body part, you are not trying to maximize the weight that you're lifting. That's not the goal. The goal is to feel the muscle, the target muscle more. This is bodybuilding yeah. uh, stuff. This is not power lifting or strength training. Don't worry about the weight. Worry about the feel, which means you're going to have to lighten the load quite a bit to feel the exercise where you want to feel to it. To me, this is the real value of bodybuilding. And you know, I, I'm, I'm coming from a place of all pure performance athleticism. That's the only focus is just movement quality and all that. But to be able to really connect to, like you said, like be able to flex a muscle on command, uh, very helpful for uh, you know you being able to kind of bring that into those exercises and especially address certain issues that you're wanting to uh, address. Totally. Uh, here's the next one. Um, prioritize your lagging body part at the beginning of your workout, even if that means you're going to do your isolation movements or smaller body part muscle groups at the beginning of the workout, which typically you don't want to do, right? Typically, like workout programming, you know, commandment number four or whatever is <laughs> do your big gross motor movements first, work on your big muscle groups first, and work down the list to the smaller ones. Well, that can be broken when you have a lagging body part that you really need to focus on. For example... If hamstrings, let's say your hamstrings are a weak body part, 
uh, and your workout calls for you to start with your barbell squats. That's okay to not start with squats. It's totally fine to start with leg curls and stiff-legged deadlifts first, then go to leg your, your, your barbell squat. This is true for any body part. So, and studies show this, by the way, that the body parts or the extra, and this is why you know workout programming starts with the big gross motor movements first, because you're going to get the most bang for your buck, is studies show that the first things you do, you get the most adaptation towards. And as you go down the list, it becomes less and less. And, and, and for the most part, you want to do the big exercises first. But if there's a lagging body part, do that first. Even if it's biceps or triceps, it's okay. If your triceps are lagging, it's fine to work your triceps before you work your chest. So I want to add to that because I I think yes at the beginning of, of your words and at the beginning of your week, oh, yeah. right? So there if you you're go. doing a body part split, which a lot of people do, upper body or muscle group splits like that, is – prioritizing the weak part. And traditionally what everybody does is either legs, chest, or back because they're the big muscle groups that yep. everybody cares about. That's normally the front load of your your body part split that you do. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of get to the all the secondary ones, calves, shoulders, arms, other things like that. Well, if those are if those secondary muscles are one of your lagging body parts, then not only should you prioritize the exercises within the routine at, at the front, you should all also prioritize that at the beginning of the week. Why does that matter? Well, what matter? why that matters so much is because life happens. I don't think I've ever met anybody who year in, year out, consistently never misses workouts. Uh, if you're like me or you, most of us that are in this room right now, you have these sporadic times where yeah, you got a week off or maybe you missed four days uh, this week and only got in the gym two mm -hmm. or three times. And what typically happens is somebody hits their, their muscle groups. They, they love training. Their lagging ones were later in the week. They missed those days of training. Then when they start back, they start back at their favorite muscle group again. And they, as if they're starting the week over because they had a, a bad week or maybe they took two weeks off instead of always starting back on the way. This was actually one of the single most impactful things I did for my shoulders. I had never done that. I had never said, okay, it's a lagging body part. It's a weak area. I don't like training it as much. What if it became my number one priority? And no matter how many breaks I take in this year, every time I come back to the gym after missing a couple days or weeks, I'm always starting with my shoulders. Just that alone started to develop more than what I had done in previous years. Yeah, now mm -hmm. that's that's such a, a very, very good point because people don't like to change their mix-up or their layout, even if they have lagging body parts. But that one small thing right there typically means... 15, 20, 30% more consistency right. mm -hmm. throughout the rest of the year. So that's a big one. All right, so here's the next one. This one sounds kind of obvious, but there's there's more to it than what you're about to hear. And that is that you should, if you have a lagging body part, that particular body part should be trained with yeah. more frequency. It should show up quite a bit in your program. Yeah, more frequency, more volume, and more exercises. It only makes sense. And I, and I, for, I struggled with this for a long time because I wanted everything to look balanced in my workout. I looked at my programming. Well, I can't do, you know, eight sets for my shoulders when I'm only doing, eight, you know, six sets for everything else. No, the lagging body part should be trained more frequently with more volume, meaning more exercises and sets than the other body parts. Now, I want to point out that this is our third point and not our first point. Right. And the reason why this is our third point and not our first point, and they should go in order, is that first point that we made. If you don't learn how to connect to that muscle really well- and You're just going to do more work yeah, on that's this. That's right. Yeah. And if all you do is increase frequency and volume, which this is a mistake sometimes I see, especially guys. I see this with young young guys that are trying to develop a, a, a body part. Is oh I want I need to work my chest. This is this guy. I need to work my chest more. Adam, I'm already doing it five days a week, mm -hmm. and I just I'm getting stronger a little bit on my chest, but the chest doesn't develop anymore. Well, that's because all you're doing is you're just working the triceps and the shoulders a lot more than mm -hmm. what you were working. So, it, the, the order of this is important. It's first important that you you have a good connection. You know how to flex and work that muscle really well and perform that well. And then the next natural progression to that, I think, is beginning at the beginning of workouts, beginning of the week. And then the next thing after that is, okay, now let's start to increase the frequency and the volume of it. And then it follows the exact pattern I did with my shoulders. It was first, okay, all I'm going to do is just prioritize it. I'm not going to overthink it. I'm not going to track volume. I'm not going to track anything. That itself will do exactly what you said. Gave me 10 to 15% more 
uh, you know, training, consistency, yeah, yeah, consistency around it for the year. Then the next thing was, okay, now let's start to scale this. I've become now consistent. I never miss a shoulder workout. Now let's start to build some more volume and frequency there and started doing it multiple times a week. And then that's when they really started. Yeah. To make what you do most is what you're going to improve at the most, by the way, this is true for anything. So you want to get better at squatting. Mm -hmm. You should probably be squatting more than doing other exercises. You want to get better at bench press or overhead press. Same thing. If you want a body part to accelerate its development, you should probably be training that particular body part more with more volume than the rest of your body. Well, to the point of uh, your client who is wanting to you know, train his chest quite a bit more, I have had clients and friends as well that are like, man, you know, my chest isn't responding. And so they would go super intense. They'd be doing a split routine, but then they would end up doing the entire workout is like chest mm. in that day. And they would just blow it out. And so then now the rest of the week, you know, they, they don't go quite as frequently. They're not, it's so sore. They can't, you know, so, you know, this, this frequency meaning that we're going to repeatedly uh, incorporate it, but not like over intensify it. Yeah. I'm glad you said that. That's a good word of caution. There can be too much, right? You can do too much. So more doesn't necessarily mean as much as you possibly can and fry yourself because that'll actually set you back. Now this, this takes us to the next one. And here's the biggest mistake that I see experienced lifters make when bringing up a lagging body part. They have their whole workout laid out in front of them for the week. And they're doing, let's say, 12 sets on average per body part or 15 sets per body part per week with different multiple exercises or whatever. And so let's say total for the whole week, for the whole body, it's, I don't know, let's, I'm going to make up a number, 60 sets. And everything's going great. And they're like, you know what? I want to develop my shoulders more. So I'm going to add five more sets to my shoulders. What they didn't do was compensate by reducing volume in other places. You can't just throw more volume at your body and expect it to respond, especially if you're already training really hard. You need to cut back on other stuff. And this is the tough part because people are like, but I want my shoulders to come up, but I don't want to not work out my biceps as much as I do. It's like, well, you you're, you have to sacrifice volume somewhere in order to add it where you want it to go. So we we complimented and gave credit to bodybuilding for some of the things they did great. I'm going to blame bodybuilding for fucking this up for a lot of other people. And that's because there's a lot of people that, have, that are taking a lot of steroids and can get away with skipping this step. Right. Yeah. They just keep piling on the volume and their body continues to respond because yeah, yeah. They, have a, they have an artificial signal. They're, they're, I mean, with a natural person, you have this kind of ebb and flow of your testosterone, testosterone levels, your ability to recover. Yep. When you're taking exogenous testosterone and all the other possible PEDs, your body recovers at a much faster rate. You can handle punishment. You can handle you can handle that because it's it's constantly staying up here. Mm -hmm. It's not dipping every time you overreach. And so I think that these were the people that were promoting just the, you know, oh, you got to hit it more and just keep it more and keep doing more, not knowing that you should probably adjust the rest of your programming based off of that. It took me a long time to kind of piece that together because I made this mistake uh, for a long time of just keep piling on, piling on, piling on. And sometimes less is more. And learning that if I'm going to add a more volume to an already high volume routine, then something's got to give. And it's it's better for my body yep. to pull back on something else. And you know it's also hard to let go because you're normally, what you should let go is normally the thing that you're really good at and you like doing. Yes, I was just yep. going to say <laughs> that the area that you want to cut volume from is the fast responding body part it's, that you have. I, I'm honest, it's only been maybe five years now for me where I've let go of my bicep and tricep training. Like it was, I loved training my arms so much and it's been a strength of mine since I was a kid because of how much I've trained them. And because of that, I could literally not touch them for a while and I will not lose hardly any size on them, but I still love to train them because yeah. I'm good at it and I like it and it feels good and it looks good. And so it was hard for me to kind of let that go. It's like, listen, I, I don't need to be training these things two, three times a week at all. I, if I could hit them once every other week and be fine to maintain the size on them. So what am I doing? Why am I overtaxing my body? Mm -hmm. It's just my ego getting in the way of wanting to do that. And so mm -hmm. it's taken me a long time to let go of certain things that I don't need to be training as much as the things I need to work on. Yeah, my favorite example mm -hmm. of or analogy of that is like when you're playing a video game and you're building your character and they give you like 100 points and you can dedicate some points to like speed, power, damage control, whatever. But, but if you give 100 points to one, you've got none left for the rest. So you have to kind of like 
pull from that yeah. 100 you points. You have to allocate it correctly. You have to allocate it correctly. So if, if you're doing you know 60 sets for the week and you're like, well, I want to do five more sets for my lagging body part, you got to pull it from somewhere else. And the smart thing to do is to pull it from the area that you re really respond well to because that's the area that's least likely to suffer from doing less volume. In fact, you may actually find that you're not going to suffer anything at all because it's one of those areas that you know responds uh, so well. So, all right, here's the next one, and this one is where things get a little more complicated, um, and that is that you might need to change your programming. That means the exercises that you do, the reps, the tempo, how you squeeze the repetitions. Are they at the top? Is it at the bottom? How do I do the stretch? Sometimes what you really need to do is look at your routine and I need a different bicep routine. I need a different shoulder routine. I need new workout programming. Yeah, and so we sort of talked about initially in the beginning of this about how to kind of slow it down and squeeze and have isometric mm -hmm. contraction. Well, also fast twitch yes. plays a role, right? Yes. And this is where a lot of people don't perform exercises that are – driven by acceleration and, and powerful type of uh, movements. Uh, but it actually stimulates the muscles in a whole different way that uh, a lot of times will unlock that that connectivity and that response that uh, that muscle has never uh, received before and will, sometimes will blow you up. I know Adam has uh, experienced that with his shoulders, right? Dude, not only that, so I experienced it there. You actually saying that, I'm glad you brought that up because you just brought me back to a memory I had. You know, we've all, like, because we've been doing this so long, and we've probably forgotten a lot of stuff, right? Uh, one of the things I had forgotten about until you just started sharing that story right now is I'd worked really hard on developing my chest and kind of got it to this place where, yeah, seeing, I saw very incremental change. During the time that I was getting ready for competition um, and I was looking for different variables to manipulate because I'd already felt like I'd thrown everything at it, one of the things I'd never done for my chest was explosive plyometric type training for the chest. Yeah. How often does anyone do that? No, barely ever. It was something that I incorporated and I was blown away. I, I saw another big leap in my development mm -hmm. of my chest that I hadn't seen from years of constantly training my chest because it was a variable that I hadn't really played with. And I hadn't thought, you think about that with legs a lot, right? Plyometrics for legs and explosive training for legs is kind of a- is, It's is more a, natural. Yeah, it's more a, a it's natural more progression. Yeah, or you you don't have to think too much about it. There's a lot of yeah, exercises like for that. Yeah. But if you told someone plyometrics for their chest, a, a lot of people probably scratch their head and go like, oh, what does that look like? Or what exercises could you do like plyo with your chest? Well, I tell you what, like one of my favorite things was to do the um, these explosive push-ups off the, either the BOSU ball or off of medicine balls where I come mm -hmm. off the ground and explode up. And I just, I got this great, great gains from doing something like that. So this is such a good, a, a great point. I, I also think, I know, Sal, you said this is where it could get complicated, but this also could be the low-hanging fruit. Like, let's say all the rest of them you're, you're pretty good about, but you're still having a hard time. Sometimes... You know, and this is common with people that even know what they're doing. They're just stuck in doing the same cycle of things yep. and they just haven't broken out. Like when was the last time that you thought outside the box and did some explosive shoulder work or explosive chest work? And, and when was the last time you programmed that in your programming? And if you never have, I mean, it could be just as simple as that of starting to maybe trade out something very traditional that you've been doing forever for an explosive movement towards that muscle and watch it respond. No, I'm glad you said that because programming doesn't just mean changing the exercises. It can mean changing the speed. It can mean changing the reps. Have you never trained yeah, in the changing the rest? Yeah. yeah. Have you ever never trained at the four rep range? Right? right. Well, that could be changing the programming for you, Justin. You said rest periods, right? Yeah. If you always rest a minute between sets, what happens if you go three minutes or thirty seconds? Right. Mm -hmm. Explosiveness was such a good one. I didn't even think of that, but I experienced that with push presses. That's an explosive shoulder press. Yep. I experienced that recently. I think like three years ago with uh, the 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 snatches that we did in uh, in oh, strong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My traps. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've been doing shrugs forever, real slow and controlled, and all of a sudden my traps blew up from this kind of wide grip, you know, explosive type of you know high pull movement, and it really made a big difference. So changing the programming, one of the, the main values of it, if it's is is, is it is novel. It's so different. It's new. I hate to use this word because it's so bastardized, but it shocks the body, right? So it's a new thing. 
Your body has to adapt. You're used to moving slow. Now you got to move fast or vice versa. Or you're used to resting long. Now you got to rest short or vice versa. And it gets things moving again. I, I'm, I'm so glad that Justin went that way because um, the person that will be attracted to this episode, lagging, but will probably be more of a bodybuilder mindset or someone yeah. who cares more about aesthetics. Yep. And you just, as someone who has that kind of thought process, you don't think of plyometrics and explosive training as a way to build more muscle. Mm -mm. No. You yeah. know what's funny? It activates so many fast twitch muscles. It does. Fibers. And it's yeah. and right. it, it's incredible, especially if you never do it. It's right. different if it's incorporated on a regular basis. You're right. you're probably not going to see massive gains in a, if you always do that. But if it's something you never do because you always train like a bodybuilder with a slow, controlled 422 type of tempo and everything is controlled, yep. man, doing something explosive and training that way, it it's going to send a new signal to the body. It will respond. Part of it responding is building more muscle. So yep. it's a great, great tool. And, and vice versa, going really slow. I've done this with right. explosive athletes who are used to just doing everything so quickly. Oh, and I'm yeah. like four seconds that, up that and four seconds me. down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that is just a totally different thing. And they see huge gains. Here's the last part, okay? The last part is you got to give it time. So just because you're doing all this stuff, like building muscle is a slow process. The body... You know, more muscle requires more energy. It's more, it's expensive tissue. The body doesn't really build muscle unless it thinks it needs to. And it only gives you as much as it thinks it needs. And that's it. And so it's a very slow, methodical process. Here's what it feels like, by the way. Okay. Here's what it feels like. And this is like very true for most people. You'll start training a lagging potty part. And at first you'll feel like, oh my God, I feel more of a connection. And it'll be like that for a few weeks. And then you'll be like, oh. I got a crazy pump. I normally don't get a pump in this body part. Now I'm getting a really good pump. Wow, that's great. And then you wait a few weeks and it's like, oh my God, now the muscle's getting sore like differently than it ever did before. And then it's this long process of going through that. And then, oh, now I see some muscle growth. It takes time to develop a lagging body part. I mean, I, I would say my, when I started really focusing on my shoulders, it was like a year and a half before they really made a big difference. My legs, same thing, about a year and a half before I saw a big difference. I'm glad we're wrapping up with this too because this also highlights part of the why we design our programs the way we design them. Um, something that I, when I was in my mid to late 20s I, and I had figured a lot of this programming out and understood the importance of changing the reps and tempo – I, I went through a phase of becoming this trainer who, um, you know, every work, in fact, I used to pride myself on this. No workout has ever been the same. <laughs> every workout, I'm always, you know, seeking that novel workout, changing tempos, changing reps. But the problem with that was really hard to measure the exact success. So it's important that you you manipulate a couple of these things then one, you stick to them. and then you stick to it yeah. and stay con and be patient Good point. don't expect it to happen in two days or three weeks like be consistent with it for a couple months and then manipulate another variable and and, and that's how we wrote the maps programs is you you stick in phases for an extended period of time the research supports that you could take the all the maps workouts and programs and you could do every other day and and, and at the end of the program if you were to measure the results that someone gets it would get probably the equal amount of results as the way we've organized them. But the, the fact that we've organized them makes it easier for people to piece together what's working, what's for, them. working for them and yeah. what's not. Yeah, and, and, and that's important because at some point you're going to want to individualize your routine and that's the best workout you could possibly do. Now, one thing that we have because we notice, we know this, we all of our programs are full body. All of them focus on movements for the whole body or all the body parts. The goal is always to develop a very balanced physique, either aesthetically or performance-wise, depending on the MAPS program that you follow. But we do know that in the real world, people have areas of their body that, like we said in this episode, don't respond mm -hmm. like others. And so what we've done is we've created what are called MAPS mods. These are body part workout programs, specific body parts. So like there's a bicep mod, a chest mod, there's one for glutes or quads or whatever. We have a mod for every single major muscle group. What you could do is you could follow one of because we have it all laid out for you, the you know reps, the tempo, the the sets, the exercises, specifically, and we wrote them specifically for that body part being a lagging body part, which is a diff, a little bit of different programming than if we're just training, if we're training the whole body, right? And what you do with these mods is you pick the one for the body part that's lagging for you, and you take your normal routine take out that body part out of your routine and replace it with the mod. So let's say, for example, you're following your workout routine. Everything's working great, but your biceps are lagging. You get the MAPS bicep mod, 
take out your normal bicep routine, replace it, no matter what you're doing, replace it with the MAPS bicep mod, follow that, and those these mods are designed specifically to bring up okay. lagging body parts. They're going to hyper-focus on them. That's right. They're way less expensive than full MAPS programs because they're single body parts, and also what we're doing right now because of this episode is all of these mods are 50% off. So you can pick any body part you want to focus on, get that mod. It's already a discounted price, but it's going to be additional 50% off. And you can find that at Maps Mod, so M-A-P-S-M-O-D-S, Maps Mods.com. And then the code for 50% off is Mods 50 off. So Mods 50 off, and then you'll get half off whichever one you pick. Look, if you like our information, head over to MindPumpFree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any fitness and health goal. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump Salon. Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. 